My name is Dino Tater. I'm a Southbridge resident. Uh, I'm from Leominster originally, but I've, I've now lived uh, in Southbridge longer than I lived in Leominster, thanks to my wife here, who was a Southbridge resident but to begin with. Um, she brought me here when we first got married 57 years ago for economic necessity. Uh, she was making $10 a week more than I was. So it was very, very important to get that. In those days, $10 was significant. <laughs> But anyway, I've uh, had a lifelong interest in astronomy ever since I was a toddler. I was in it. Uh, I had a science teacher in school uh, make a sub, put out a project for us all, and I put out talks about a multi-universe. And, and uh, in those days, the science teacher was not a dedicated science teacher. She probably also taught English and math and a few other things. And she gave me an A on the, on the paper. She said, I don't really understand what you're talking about, but you know about more about it than I do. So. <laughs> So I, I had a real keen interest in it, and uh, when I retired, I retired about 20 years ago, and uh, just a few years after that, I joined NASA as the title, what they call Solar System Ambassador, and that, that's quite a good title, Solar System. How many people, you know, as an ambassador, every planet in the solar system? Anyway, this is National, National History Month, National Women's History Month, <laughs> and it's a very important subject, <coughs> because until the movie Hidden Figures came out, a lot of people didn't even know that women made a contribution to the space program. But there are those of us who think that if it weren't for the female of the species, we may never have landed on the moon. Are you going to see women now tonight who are absolutely brilliant, smart, some smarter than the engineers they worked for. They're brave, they're tenacious, they face discrimination and prejudice. In those days, it was very hard for a, for a woman <coughs> to get a job with any meaningful role or good paycheck. If you were a black woman, it was twice as hard. So it, uh, it was really, it's changed a lot over the years. They've come a, come a long way. Like all discrimination, we've still got a way to go. We haven't yet reached our more perfect society. Anyway, <coughs> it's gonna be in four parts. First is the non-NASA contributors, because some of these ladies who weren't with NASA were before, did their job before NASA was in existence. <laughs> and it, um, they made a fantastic contribution NASA, by the way, the Na National Space and Aeronautics Administration, originally was NACA, the National Council on Aerospace or, or something like that. It was an advisory committee. And at World War II, the need came so great, they became NASA and got a lot more authority and a better budget. The second part will be the hidden figures, not the movie, but the ladies who did what you saw in the movies. And we'll cover them because uh, most of you have seen that movie. I think you do want to know a little about them. The third part of those people in space, that's the astronauts, the female astronauts. The last part is in memoriam. That's just a little salute to the, uh, the ladies who didn't make it uh, on their space adventures. So the non-contributors, and there were a lot of them. This is Valentina Tereshkova, and that's the Vostok 6 spacecraft. She was the first female astronaut to venture into space and piloted that Vostok 6 around the Earth for 48 hours. And that was sort of gave the United States a kick in the pants and said, you gotta get moving because you're falling behind Russia. And in those days, all the first were being done by Russia. Um, it's strange, they did not have a real good landing system. You know, Russia always lands on, on the ground. They don't go in the ocean. The country's so big and so vast. <laughs> but didn't have a good system. So at 20,000 feet, that's four miles up, she jumped out of the Vostok on a parachute and parachuted the rest of the way to Earth. And she's the only woman, only woman to ever do that. Now, she was an avid skydiver. And after she flew in space, for the next 20 years, no woman ever sp flew in space again. And since her, no woman has flown a solo space flight like she did. On the ground, her job was to train the male cosmonauts. And in Russia, you weren't an astronaut, you were a cosmonaut. She retired as an Air Force Major General and became a politician. And when she, uh, she met Putin after this, and she told Putin, she says, when we get a spaceship that's going to Mars, I want to be on board. So it's quite a daring lady. This is Svetlana Savitskaya, <laughs> second woman in space, also a Russian. And that's the Soyuz 7 space uh, uh, station. She was the f second woman in space, the first to conduct a spacewalk. And she visited the space station twice. She was a daredevil from the, from the get-go. You know, by, um, <coughs> by her 17th birthday, she had made parachute jumps 450 times. 
and she has made three world record jumps from the stratosphere and 15 world record jumps from jet planes. She's a record-breaking jet pilot, and she's got her image on a stamp in Russia. She's a member of the Coordination and Council Presidium of the National Patriotic Union and elected a deputy of the State Duma representing the Communist Party. The State Duma is like our Congress, so it's an important role. She must, they must like her. She's re-elected four times, and she's a deputy chair of the Committee on Defense. So she retired in 93 from the Air Force, the rank of major. On her second space trip, she received all these recognitions. Twice the title of Hero of the Soviet Union, twice the Order of Lenin, a special medal for the record stay, Order of the Badge of Order, a gold medal, 18 diplomas from the International Aeronautical Federation, and 16 sports medals, because she was a sportswoman as well. Now, the one thing you'll notice <coughs> about these ladies they have in common, other than their dedication and their, their, their tenacity, they're all extremely well educated. It's like having a master's degree, pff, like going to kindergarten. I gotta get a bachelor's, I've gotta get my, my BS, and you gotta get in four or five different universities in four or five different fields. So they're some of the best educated women in the world. This is Donnie Elbert. She was a key collaborator of Subi Chandaska, an Indian American theoretical physicist, and she co authored 18 publications with him. And this is the first example of the work women do that the men take credit for. Uh, she, he wrote a book in 1961, and her work appeared in that book. It could have had a footnote, but never mentioned its significance or gave any real credit. And then he won the Nobel Prize. So she was the first to predict conditions be optimal for a planet or a star to generate its own magnetic field. And if you're not familiar with that, the magnetic field is the th one thing that keeps us from getting burned alive by radiation. Uh, so they call it the Albert Range, and they spent years refining and expanding on her groundbreaking work to arrive at enhanced predictions of how planets and stars form a magnetic field. And her work helps researchers better understand condition on our own interior and to identify planets outside our solar system that have a magnetic field. And she created a theory for how planetary magnetic fields form. And her work helps our own scientists understand our own planet. Now, it points to planets that have a magnetic field strong enough to uh, protect life. Now, what I mean by protection is this. We have here the sun, and the little white dot is the earth. In all these rays, this is the magnetic field. The radiation leaves the sun, bounces against the magnetic field around Earth, rather than coming straight at us. If it came straight at us, we'd all be in deep trouble. You may remember a couple of decades ago, there was a lot of problem and concern about the ozone layer de being depleted. That's part of this magnetic field. This is Annie Jump Cannon. She's got her image on a, on a coin. It's a one dollar gold coin, but she went to Wellesley College where she uh, studied physics and astronomy, and she was a member of the Harvard Computers, and that's just like the hidden figure computers. They did the calculations. Her goal was to complete the map and, and to find every single star in the sky. Now all you have to do is look up at night and see that, and you know she did a heck of a job. Worked for Edward Pickering, and she created the Harvard Classification Scheme, which was the first serious attempt to organize and develop and classify stars based on their temperatures and their spectral types. She was the first woman to receive an honorary doctorate degree from Oxford and was an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society and was awarded a doctor's degree in math and astronomy from Grogan University. During her career, she helped women gain acceptance and respect within the scientific community. And the uh, International Astronomical Union came out with an Annie Cannon jump award that they award every year to a woman for her contribution to science and astronomy. Now here's where they, they, we had fun. Ken and the other women the observatories were all criticized for being out of their place and not being housewives. Now at that time, women did not commonly rise below the level of assistance in this field. We only paid 25 cents an hour to work seven hours a day, six days a week. Why seven hours instead of eight? I don't really know. I assume so they have time to get home to make, hut, make supper for their husbands. Anyway, she classified more stars in her lifetime than anyone else with a total of 350,000 stars. 
They say she could classify herself faster than any other living human being. And she had a, bio, a bibliography that included 200,000 uh, references. This is Henrietta Leavitt. She's from Lancaster, Massachusetts. Play one of the most underestimated women of our time. She changed astronomy forever. And it's just now getting credit for it 80 years after she, or 80 or 100 years after her death. She attended Radcliffe College, Oberlin College, and got a BS from Harvard. And she worked with Annie Jump Cannon, the one you just saw, at the Harvard Observatory, and they shared the experience of being deaf. In 85, Pickern at Harvard University hired her as a computer. Though highly educated, they were prohibited from using a telescope and are paid about as much as an unskilled laborer was. And uh, apparently he wanted them to work and not think. I had a boss like that when I was a teenager. I lasted about a week. Anyway, she discovered what we call Safed variables. And um, a Safed variable, it's called Safed because it comes from the constellation Safed. A variable is a star that brightens, dims, brightens, dims. Pickard published her work under his name and she never received the credit for her work in her lifetime. He did. Her discovery led to way to accurately measure the distances on an intergalactic scale and pay for our understanding today of the structured universe. So we have some, some uh, stars that are four light years away, some that are a thousand light years away. Her method gave us what, the tool we needed to determine those distances. And we call it a standard candle and it's still used today and it also defined the size of the Milky Way. We know the Milky Way from one end of the, of the uh, spiral to the other is 100,000 light years. We know that because of her work. And it, uh, she was nominated for the Nobel Prize for Harvard for her variable discovery. And the people who nominated her only, when they did it, only discovered that she had died four years earlier. Now we know Edwin Hubble, he uh, discovered uh, that the Milky Way is not, not an island universe. And he was able to make his discovery for the Milky Way by using her discovery. Without her discovery, he would never have noticed this. And he didn't give her credit till much later. So she's a Massachusetts resident who allowed Hubble to become famous on her work. He never credited her work as, as the reason for his discovery of the actual distance of the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, he spotted that by spotting safe and varied was in the image he took of that galaxy. So she was a member of Phi Beta Kappa, and her death at age of 53 from stomach cancer was a real loss to the science world. She has all these awards, and asteroid 5383 Levitt and a crater on the moon uh, are named in her honor. Then it's there to honor deaf men and women who have worked as astronomers. So she got a lot of credit, but she, she never knew it. How many people have heard of the Mercury 13? Most people have heard of the Mercury 7. That's the first class of astronauts. This is an interesting thing. The Mercury 13 were American women who took place in a privately funded program. That means NASA did not fund it. And it was run by William Lovelace, who was testing women for space flight. Uh, he was a former flight surgeon and helped develop the test for the NASA astronauts. In those days, we hadn't had a spaceman yet. So they didn't know what to test them for. So they tested them for everything they could possibly think of and a few other things beside that. It was a pretty torturous route. Anyway, uh, they had the same physical, physiological screening test as the astronauts selected by NASA. And they were not part of NASA's program. They never flew in space and they never got together as a whole group. But they're all accomplished pilots. Some of these ladies had three and 4,000 hours flying time. And most of them flew multiple times of, uh, types of aircraft. You'll see some women in here who were licensed to fly 30 different types of aircraft. Anyway, NASA required astronauts at that time to be graduates of military jet, jet testing pilots. And at that time, the military did not allow women to be a, a test pilot. So they couldn't be an astronaut. In 1972, they put an amendment to the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that finally granted women legal assistance uh, to uh, become a, a, enter the space team. That was put through by Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, LBJ doesn't get a lot of credit for space program, but he was one of the key figures behind it. In fact, when, we, when Kennedy made the commitment to, for us all to uh, go to the moon and get back, uh, 
that Kennedy, he was good, but I'm not sure he was a real fan of space program. But at that time, Russia was ahead of us on all fronts in space, all fronts. <laughs> the first man, the first woman, the first satellite, the first dog, you know, everything. <laughs> and uh, so JFK was president at the time, and he called Lyndon Baines in and said, what can we do with the spectacular that will give us the lead? And Lyndon said, we can get a man to the moon and bring him back. And right after that, LBJ made the famous speech. So uh, LBJ did good. In 1978, the JEP pilot requirement was no longer an obstacle to the women candidates. And NASA had its first class that year. They admitted a new, a new category of person, the mission specialist. Well, this is the Mercury 13 list. At 41, Jane Hart was the oldest candidate and the mother of eight. So she was a very busy woman. Uh, and uh, Wally Funk was the youngest at 23 and married and Janet Dietrich were twin sisters. This is Bill Lovelace. I always think he looks like a movie star in that picture, you know what? Clark Gable type. Anyway, the, as I mentioned, the women were really downplayed a lot. The media often portrayed the women as unqualified candidates due to their frail and emotional structure and that they plan that it cannot undergo the severity that men do. You girls all feel frail and emotional? And no. <laughs> do any of you think a man can handle delivering a baby? No. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Wally uh, Funk, and you probably all know her now because it was big news, she was launched into space on a suborbital flight aboard Blue Origin's New Shepard 4 in 2021 making her oldest woman to go into space at 82. And she was the original, Mer one of the original Mercury 13. So she finally ruled, um, realized her dream. These are the hit, hidden figures. These are the, what was termed a computer. Okay? And this was before the real computers came out. And I can remember back then, because when I first started my, first, my job, we had computers, but we called them dumb computers because they didn't have a hard drive. Every morning I turned on the computer, I took a floppy disk, put it in, and that disk told the computer what to do. At the end of the day, I took it out. And it, uh, so they didn't even have memories in those days. So Margaret Hamilton, <coughs> this young lady played a, a role. You know, MIT was a critical part of our development. And she was on the team that did the flight software for the Apollo program, which landed us on the moon. And one of the many contributors was Margaret Hamilton, computer scientist who led the software division of the uh, MIT Instrumentation Laboratory. And you can see, this is how much software it took to get us to the moon. And it took her all the way up there. Melba Mouton graduated from Harvard with a bachelor's degree in mathematics and a minor in physics. Started working with NASA in 59 and got the Apollo Achievement Award and the Exceptional Performance Award. She was the head computer programmer for the program production section chief at Goddard Space Center and was head math mathematician for satellites Echo 1 and 2. And you don't hear a lot of Echo 1 and 2, but there were two of them, and there's this little round thing, sort of a, an answer to Sputnik, you might say. She served as the ch ch assistant chief of research program at our Trajectory and Geodynamics Division, head of the group of NASA mathematicians called the computers, and was instrumental in coding and calculating spacecraft trajectories that brought us to the moon and allowed us to land safely on the moon. She died in Silver Spring, Maryland in 1990 of a brain tumor at the age of 61. In recognition for what her work, the work she did, in 2023, a lunar mountain was named Mons Mouton, Mount Mouton, in her honor. And this is one way NASA thanks the people who who made real dedicated effort. They, they'll, they'll give them a name on a, on a planet or a moon or something like that. Mary Jackson was in the movie, <laughs> Hidden Figure. She was an American mathematician and aerospace engineer, and she started as a computer at the segregated West Area Computing Division. Now, the reason we had the, the uh, West Area is World War II. All our guys were gone, created a work shortage, a shortage of workers in the United States. That's when the women stepped up, and you know, Rosie the Riveter, in all the various jobs. And prior to that, if you were black and you had a college degree, you got to teach at a black school. A teacher, that, that's what all you could do. And it was the best job you could get. But with the opening of the West Wing, created a, a real chance for these brainiacs to get a good job and a decent paycheck. 
So, uh, but you weren't allowed to be an engineer. You know, you, you, you stuck in your computer room. Uh, she was the first American female engineer at, the, at NASA and earned bachelor's degrees in mathematics and physical science from Hampton University. That was a black university. And in 53, accepted an offer to work for Kazmierik Sadnecki in a supersonic pressure tunnel. This offer and this acceptance changed her life for the better. He encouraged her to undergo training so she could be promoted to become an engineer. But she needed to take graduate level coffers that were offered at, by the University of Virginia at the all white Hampton High School, which was all white, a segregated school, you're not allowed to go. So she had to petition the city of Hampton to allow her to attend the classes. Well, she, she petitioned him, she got a, uh, a judge to rule in her favor, <coughs> and she attended it, and she'd go to class, and there were the guys, she was the only woman in the class, but the guys were there were the same guys she worked with all day long. <laughs> and uh, after completing the course, she was promoted to aerospace engineer in 58, and became NASA's first female black engineer. Another glass ceiling broken. She ultimately co-authored 12 technical papers for NACA and NASA, and in 2020, the satellite NUSAT-7 was named after her and launched into space. She served more than 30 years as a Girl Scout leader. She was very civic-minded, you know, outside the job, and she was a, a tremendous Girl Scout leader. She just didn't sit there and read a book. If they wanted a, a badge for occupation, a badge, a merit badge for occupation of a certain occupation, she took them to the shop and let them go around and talk to the people who work there, things of that nature. Uh, she also helped them with their math and, and all of that stuff, because she was, a, like I said, she was a brainiac on math. So she helped the kids with that as well. Very dedicated girl. And uh, she, in 70s, she helped African-American children in her community create a miniature wind tunnel for testing airplanes. So they really learned something. <coughs> the film Hidden Figures represents her, her, the careers of Jackson, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and uh, working on Project Mercury during the space race. And she's portrayed in the field by Janelle Monet. NASA headquarters building in Washington, D.C. was renamed the Mary W. Jackson NASA headquarters in 2021. And in 2019, she was posthumously awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Would be nice if they could get some of these awards while they're still walking. Yes. Katherine Johnson was also in the film. He has a BS in mathematics and French from West Virginia State College. By 13, she was attending high school on the campus of historically black West Virginia State College. At 18, she enrolled in West Virginia State College, graduated with highest orders. Now, a lot of these ladies, as teenagers, made money by babysitting for the white folk, uh, cleaning the houses for the white folk, doing things like that. They were the really uh, low end of the employment ladder but it gave them the income they needed to pay their way through school. So she did the trajectory, trajectory analysis of Alan Shepard's Freedom 7, America's first man uh, human space flight, and she calculated the launch window for it. Now the launch window, the landing window, extremely important, especially on the landing. If you land wrong, if you come in too, too shallow, you're gonna dive in and burn up if you land too, if you land on a level too much, you're going to bounce off and circle the universe for the rest of your life. So Catherine and Engineer Ted Skubinski co-hosted this, and now this, this uh, article, Determination of Azimuth Angle at Burnout for Placing the Satellite Over Selected Earth Position. That's quite a paper, and it basically it, it uh, lays out the equations describing an orbit from start to end of a spacecraft. And of course the end is important because the Navy has to know where to put the recovery ship. This was the first time a woman in the Flight Service Division had received credit as an author to a report. In 62, as they prepared the orbital mission for John Glenn, she did her duty that she would mostly become known for. Uh, the flight required construction of a communication network linking tracking stations around the world to IBM computers in Washington, Cape Canaveral, and Bermuda. The computers had been programmed for orbital equations that would control the trajectory of Glenn's Friendship 7 from liftoff to splashdown. Now, the astronauts were a little wary of the use of the computer. The computers were brand new. <laughs> the one they had was making mistakes. <laughs> okay, so you don't want to put your life in the hands of that computer. So, 
That's when John Glenn said, get the girl, meaning Johnson, to run the same numbers uh, through the same equations that had been programmed by the computer, but by hand on her desktop machine. If she says they're good, then I'm ready to go. Now that scene is in the movie, and it, that, that scene actually happened. Uh, his flight was a success and marked a turning point in the um, competition between the United States and the Soviet Union in space. She co-authored 26 scientific papers and helped calculate the trajectory for the Apollo 11 flight to the moon. When the Apollo 13 mission was aborted, do you remember that was the one on the way to the moon, one of the power packs blew up, and so they had to decide, do we turn around and go home or do we go to the moon? It was decided it was safer to go to the moon because once you whipped around the, the moon, it gave you a gravitational push and increased your speed back to Earth. It would take most of your fuel just to stop the aircraft from going in one direction and turn around. So anyway, she, uh, her work on the backup procedures helped set a safe path for the crew's return. And Mattel made a Barbie doll in her likeness, complete with a NASA badge on it. Two NASA facilities have been named in her honor. A building was named the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility, and this is her in her older age. Uh, <coughs> they renamed the Independent Verification and Validation Facility to the Katherine Johnson Independent Verification and Validation Facility. She was awarded an honorary doctorate of the college of, by, by the uh, College of William Mary, and Webster State University made a STEM scholarship in honor of her and erected a life-size statue on her campus, and that's the statue. George Mason University named the most uh, the prominent building on this SciTech campus the Katherine Johnson Hall. And Northrop Grumman named it Cygnus NG spacecraft the SS Katherine Johnson. She received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Silver Snoopy Award, the NASA Group Achievement Award, Congressional Gold Medal. The Snoopy Award is not a joke, by the way. That's an award NASA gives to people who've really done some great stuff. She was portrayed in the, FIP, in the movie by Tarridge Henson. Dorothy Vaughn, the third hidden, hidden figure. <coughs> the book itself deals with more than just the three of them, but you couldn't do all their stories in one movie. And if you have a chance to rent the book, Hidden Figure, get it from your library, it is a very worthwhile read. It gives you a lot of the history of NASA, what went on, what it was like for these ladies, and it's just a wonderful book. You can get it right from this library, but not for the next week because I haven't returned it yet. <laughs> She's got a BA in mathematics from Wilberforce University, was NASA's first African-American manager and head of the West Computing Unit for about 10 years. The engineers <coughs> found these computers, found pets in these computers, ladies that they trusted more than anyone else. And if they had a special work to do, a complicated work, they requested I want Dorothy to do it. I want Catherine to do it. I want Mary to do it. Because they had so much faith in that, that one particular person. <coughs> and she became an expert on the Fortran program. That's a high-level computer program language used especially for scientific computations. She contributed to the Scout launch vehicle that gave us access for uh, 30 years. Most people haven't heard of Scout, but it was one of our first ventures to help on space. And it's considered the, the uh, unsung hero of our space program. In the movie, she was portrayed by Octavia Spencer, and her legacy lives on in the successful careers of the notable alumni from the West area. This is Christine Darden, a mathematician, data analyst, and aeronautical engineer. She graduated from Hampton University with a BS in mathematics, earned an MS in applied mathematics at Virginia State, a PhD in engineering at George Washington, and got an ordinary degree from North Carolina State University. As I said, these, these ladies just don't know how to settle for one degree. You know, they, they gotta get two, three, and four of them. And they're absolutely brilliant people. She was the first African-American woman at Langley to uh, be promoted to senior executive service. And was a technical leader of the Sonic Boom Group. Now the Sonic Boom Group was an important group because we were approaching the speed of sound. We had to find ways to minimize the boom, uh, make to make sure it didn't damage the spacecraft. And if you, if you fly out of any of our big airports, you notice you, you take off, you don't take off like this, you take off like this. That's because of noise, the sonic boom. The noise pollution of the big cities like Boston, New York, they don't want it terrifying 
all the people below at the end of the runway. And at the same time, they don't want to live with it 100 times a day. So they take off at a high incline so that the boom doesn't hit the ground. She was a technical lead for the NASA High Speed Research Program and director of our Aerial Performance Center Management Office. And she was the head of Langley's Strategic Communications Office. She's the author of more than 50 publications in the field of high lift wing design, supersonic flow, flap divine, supersonic boom prediction, and sonic boom minimization. And has a Lifetime Achievement Award from Women in Aerospace. She was a Black Engineer of the Year Award for Outstanding Achievement in Government, the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, and the NASA Equal Opportunity Medal. She has three certificates of outstanding performance from Langley, the Presidential Citizenship Award at Hampton University, awarded the Congressional Gold Medals, the Dr. A.T. Weathers Technical Achievement Award, Senior Executive Career Development Fellowship, and the National Coalition of 100 Black Women gave her the Candace Award for Science and Technology. This is Mary Sherman Morgan. So she almost didn't get into this uh, because of her family. They lived on a farm, and her father would not let her go to school. He wanted her on the farm working. And one day a social worker shows up with a sheriff, and he took the kid, enrolled her in school, and told the father, if she doesn't go to school, you go to jail. So then she started at school. Uh, after that, she went to DeSales College in Toledo, Ohio as a chemistry major. Now that was an important move for her, an important move for the country, as far as her contributions go. <coughs> because, because of her chemistry background after being at that school, she was offered a job at a factory in Ohio. They wouldn't tell her what a job would be. They wouldn't tell her what the, what the factory did. All they would say is, you need a top secret clearance. So she went in anyway, and it turned out to be the Plumbrook Ordnance Works, which was charged with the responsibility of developing munitions like TNT and all other things. And during World War II, this site produced more than one billion pounds of high explosives that were used during the war. So they actually helped arm the country for a war. After spending the war years designing explosives for the military, she went to work for North American Aviation in their Rocketdyne Division. And soon after, she was promoted to the role of theoretical performance specialist. And that required that she develop new fuels, and new ways to make fuels more efficient. <coughs> Due to her experience, her work resulted in the birth of a new propellant called Hyine. And that could increase a, a rocket's efficiency by 12%. Means it could lift that much a bigger load. And out of 900 engineers on the job, she was the only woman. Talk about the purple chair in a room of yellow chairs, huh? Really stands out. She died of uh, COPD, emphysema in 2004 at the age of 82. This is Vanessa Weiss. Uh, she was the first African-American to lead NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and is the first black woman to be a director of any NASA center. Don't let anyone discourage you from pursuing your dream. This is the Johnson Space Center. It's home to our astronaut corps, Mission Control Center, the International Space Station, Orion and Gateway programs, and it's more than 11,000 civil service employees and contractors. And she heads it all up. She attended Clemson University, got a <coughs> BS in ma materials engineering and a master's in sci of science in bioengineering, and was project manager of space and life sciences director. She was responsible for the development and use of suites of hardware systems for medical and microgravity experiments in space and on the International Space Station. And she led a team of 400 engineers and scientists that are working on ways to send human beings to Mars. She received all of these awards. These are the women of NASA in space. Two quick statistics for you. In the past half century, just over 60 women have flown in space. By contrast, more than 582 men have flown during the same period. Now, a good part of that is because of when we first started, women weren't allowed to be test pilots, therefore they weren't allowed to be astronauts. But when a mission goes up today, there's, all, there's always females on board, so it's coming along. But they've done more than just go along for the ride. The lifetime accomplishments of these women who have flown in space are often staggering and the contribution's groundbreaking. Four women and 20 men have died during the program. And here are some of their stories. Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman in space, entered college at 16 years old 
earning a BSA, a BS and a BA engineering degree from Stanford, an MD doctorate in medicine from Cornell, and she interned at the Los Angeles County Medical Center. She joined the Peace Corps to serve as a doctor in Africa. So see that these women give back a lot. You know, they don't just sit on their laurels. She flew on the space shuttle Endeavour in 92 and did 44 science experiments with a crew. And it was her only space flight. <laughs> She also wrote several books for children and holds several honorary degrees. She was introduced into the National Women's Hall of Fame and the International Space Hall of Fame. But she had some fun too. She was inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. and Nicole Nichols, who played Uhura in Star Trek, to pursue her dreams of exploration. But she appeared on television several times and in the 93 episode of Star Trek, and here she is with Jordy. Katie Coleman, but she received her Ph. degree in polymer science and engineering from the University of Mass at Amherst. And it's at the University of Mass where I spent a few hours with Katie. Uh, we were there for a Girl Scout jamboree. There were like 4,000 Girl Scouts there, and uh, we were working with them all. But she came up to me when we first, when we first uh, and Pella had introduced herself to me. He said, haven't we met before? I can only think, isn't that the man's line? <laughs> 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 well, she also got a BS degree in chemistry from MIT and was chief of robotics for the astronaut office to include rob robotic arm operations and training of all space shuttle and international space station missions. She's a chemist and engineer, former United States Air Force colonel and a retired NASA astronaut. She's a veteran of two space shuttle missions and orbited the Earth 256 times, traveled over 6 million miles. She was a mission specialist in charge of deploying the Chandra X-ray Observatory. That's the observatory out in space that we use to locate exoplanets on other, on, on other solar systems. During the flight, <coughs> she had a good sense of humor. She reported to Mission Control that she spotted an unidentified flying object. Well, it was a newbie on the space station who didn't hold on and he bounced off the ceiling. <laughs> so she called him an unidentified flying object. She participated in NEMO 7 aboard the uh, Aquarius uh, Underwater Laboratory as an aquanaut, living and working underwater for 11 days. She won the uh, prestigious John F. Kennedy National Award, and she's part of the band Bandela, which also includes fellow NASA astronaut Stephen Robinson, Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield, and Mickey Pettit, who is the wife of another astronaut. And she played one of the instruments live from orbit on National Public Radio. This is Sunita Williams, and Sunita really m matches her nickname, Sunny. Just a very nice person. She's a Bachelor of Science degree in Physical Science from the United States Naval Academy, Master of Science degree in Engineering Management from the Florida Institute of Technology, and the, she had the record for the most spacewalks by a woman. She made seven of them, and the spacewalk time for a woman, 50 hours and 40 minutes. Uh, she no longer holds the record. Another woman has beaten her out. But she had it for quite a while. As an aviator, she received H 46 C night training in Helicopter Combat Squadron 3. And this is the type of uh, helicopter she flew. <laughs> so she was assigned to Helicopter Combat Support Squadron 8 and made overseas deployments to the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf for Operation Desert Seal and Operation Provide Comfort. She was an officer in charge of a detachment sent to Miami, Florida for Hurricane Andrew and uh, relief operations aboard the USS Sylvania. And was a Navy, went to the Navy Test Pilot School as an instructor in Rotary Wing Department. On the USS Saipan, she was the aircraft handler and the assistant air boss. And she has logged more than 3,000 flight hours on 30 different types of aircraft. Now, she was a fan of the Boston Marathon and she actually ran it, but she did it from space. The only person ever to run the Boston Marathon in space. She did it in four hours and 24 minutes. And here she is on the treadmill uh, running. And her crew supported her. They'd come along every now and then, cheer her on. They'd come on, give her an orange or something to, to keep, just refresh her and keep her going. But she completed it. Uh, the Needham Public Schools uh, named the school's new elementary school after Sunny. And she was awarded the uh, Sanda something uh, Patel someone someone award by the World Geographic Society. I would not even try to pronounce those names. <laughs> Sally Ride. Now, 
Sally Ride, uh, <coughs> she has a, we gave her a stamp and she's on a quarter. She's the first American woman to fly in space and went to Stanford for BS, MS, and PhD in physics. As I said, one degree isn't enough. After five years of training, she finally flew in a space shuttle Challenger in 83 and then again in 84. She helped develop the shuttle's robotic arm and she served on the team that invited the Challenger's disaster and the Columbia disaster. And she uh, died of pancreatic, pancreatic cancer in 2012. In April 2013, the United States Navy announced that a research ship would be named in her honor, and this is the RV Sally Ride. She won the Presidential Medal of Freedom posthumously. If there's an award out there, she won it. She was a competitive tennis player. She actually played in the double with, against, against Billie Jean King. She lost. <laughs> but after a couple of days of seeing the training they go through, they play tennis six, seven, eight hours a day. She was so sore, she said, the heck with that, it'll be easier to be an astronaut. This is Eileen Collins, and she's a good example of how far women have come in the space program. She was the first woman to pilot the space shuttle, and she was the first woman to command the space mission. So no more sitting in the, in the uh, passenger seat, she was in the driver's seat. She has 6,700 hours in 30 different types of aircraft, and 872 hours in space. In space, that equals about six months. She retired in the Air Force in 2005 and NASA in 2006 with the Distinguished Flying Cross, NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, and was an, into the Astronaut Hall of Fame, among other Hall of Fames, and served as the advisor to the National Space Council and board member of the Astronauts Memorial Foundation. <laughs> she worked herself, put herself through college, uh, studying math and science. Now, when she was in high school, she was not the greatest student, and. Uh, after she graduated, she looked back and she said, I just wasted four years. What, the, what was I doing? So she went on, you see, to get the associate's degree in mathematics at Corning, Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics at Syracuse, Master of Science degree in Operations Research at Stanford, Master of Arts degree in Space Shuttles at Webster University. So she made up, made up for it. She, she went extra to make up for that lack of attention at, at uh, high school. She's now married with two children, lives in San Antonio, and travels the world as a motivational speaker. And the fact that she didn't do what she should have done in high school impressed her so much that if young people give, ask her for advice, she says, make the most of your high school years. It's an important foundation. <laughs> now this is our last section, the Women of NASA in memoriam. Kind, kind of sad, but with anything as dangerous as space exploration, it's, it's gonna happen. If you think they're sitting on seven million pounds of the world's highest explosive, most volatile explosive, and someone's gonna put a match at the bottom of that candle. I mean, that's dangerous. There's just no two ways about it. Especially since it was, was all new technology and new fuels and new science. Well, you all know Krista McAuliffe, uh, America's teacher in space. She has a bachelor's degree in education and history from Framingham State College, and a master's degree in education supervision and administration from Bowie State University. In 85, she was chosen by NASA for the Teacher in Space program. Now, she didn't just call NASA and say, I'll, I'll go. She had to fight off thousands of applicants. There are teachers all over the country that wanted this position. And so she was decided to be the one that would be the best at it. Once she reached orbit, the plan was to have her teach listen, lessons to school kids all around the country. Now, California and New York, uh, Maine or New Mexico, you could call get this lesson. It would have, been, would have been pretty much worldwide, really. So it was a great opportunity. But alongside her six fellow astronauts, she died when the space shuttle Challenger exploded moments after leaving the launch pad. Now, you remember what happened here? The, 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 the launch had been canceled four or five times due to different problems. And so they really wanted to take off this day. But the night before, the weather in Florida was freezing. Now, the, uh, the Rocket was made of parts, and where the two parts met, there was an O-ring made of rubber. Well, that O-ring got so frozen, it got brittle. And when that happened, gases escaped, and kaboom, it blew up. And I, I never forget this picture. I saw it on television. But she was posthumously awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor in 2004. But her original lesson plan was finally carried out by NASA in 2016. So her mission was accomplished. Framingham State, her alma mater, has the Krista McAuliffe Center. It's built to resemble mission control. 
Now, I don't know what the hours are or when it's open to the public, but if you get a chance to see it, it's worth seeing. It's a, it's a, ni it's a nice, nice center. This is Judy Resnick, <laughs> sophomore engineer, biomedical engineer, pilot, and astronaut. She's the second woman to uh, fly in space and the first Jewish woman of any nationality to fly in space. At 17, she entered Carnegie Institute of Technology, got a degree in uh, electrical engineering from Carnegie Mellon, a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland, and she worked for R RCA as an engineer on Navy missile and radar projects. She was a senior systems engineer for Xerox Corporation. A lot of people don't know, but companies like RCA and Xerox had a lot to do with the uh, early space program, them, Burroughs, and a bunch of other companies. <laughs> she operated the Space Shuttle's robotic arm, which she helped create, which she was an expert. And she was a design engineer on missile and radar projects. She developed software and operating procedures for missions and was a man of the NASA, awarded the NASA Space Flight Medal for her first flight. The landmarks building name for her included dormitory at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Judith A. Elementary School in Maryland, and many others. We have a crater on the moon named after her. This crater right over here. The other ones are all the rest of her crew members. And the, the one on Venus was uh, as well. We also named 356 Resnick after her. You know, she died when the shuttle Challenger exploded. And she was possibly whom she awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor. This is Laurel Clark, a captain in the United States Navy. <laughs> it's a postgraduate graduate medical education in pediatrics at the National Naval Medical Center, a Navy undersea medical train, officer training at the Na Naval Undersea Institute in Groton, Connecticut, completed diving, officer, diving medical officer training at the Naval Diving and Salvage Training Center in Panama City, Florida. She was designated a radiation health officer and an undersea medical officer and served with Submarine Squadron 14. Uh, she was the medical department head in Holy Loch, Scotland, and dove with Navy, Navy divers and, and Naval Special Warfare Unit 2 SEALs. So she was with a tough crowd. She performed many medical evacuations from the United States submarines. It was designated as a Naval Submarine Medical Officer and uh, Diving Medical Officer. She perished with all her crew uh, when the uh, Shuttle Columbia burnt up on Rantree and was posthumously granted uh, the Congressional Space Medal of Honor. This is Kalpana Chalwa, India's first woman in space. The shuttle, she was the shuttle's primary robotic arm operator. Uh, she was an aeronautical engineering degree from Punjab Engineering College, Master of Science degree in aerospace engineering, University of Texas, a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado, was a certified flight instructor for all types of, air, of aircraft and became a United States citizen in 1991. She was responsible for deploying the, the uh, Spartan satellite. And during the launch of Columbia's 28th mission, that's how often we use these shuttles, uh, a piece of foam insulation broke off from the space shuttle's external tank and stuck the wing of the orbiter. When Columbia re-entered the atmosphere of the Earth, the damage allowed for atmospheric, hot atmospheric gases to penetrate and deter, destroy the internal wheel structure, which caused the spacecraft to become unstable and break apart. Her remains were identified along with those of the rest of the crew, and members were, were uh, cremated and scattered at Zion National Park in Utah in accordance with her wishes. Now, <coughs> Now, since, they, since that happened, they put in a new procedure before the space shuttle leaves the uh, International Space Station. It circles around and turns so the crew inside the space station can look it over and see if there's any parts missing. So she perished with all of her crew and the Columbia burnt up. Now, this is the way we were. This is mission control for the Apollo 11 mission. This is the only woman in the picture. That's Joanne Morgan, and if it weren't for her, there wouldn't be a single woman in the room. And how big is that room? That's how big. And there she is. She um, was the only woman there for the uh, Apollo liftoff, and so she's a champion not only for women in the agency, but women across the country that are involved with the STEM program. So that's how we were. <coughs> this is how we are now. 
if you look probably a third to a half of these people here in the control room are female and they're they're up right up there with the men now doing a great job so many women now help us conquer space they have magnificent contributions okay well thank you for kind attention as we say at nasa they are great things thank you all yeah.